The, the hope of this world is, no, is not found in any single politician. It's not found in any political party. It's not found in anything that has to do with the kingdoms in this world because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And if it were, I would have fought to defend it, but it's not. So are you thinking about and meditating on Jesus' return and thinking about that day, and are you thinking to yourself, he could come back anytime like a thief in the night. No one knows, not even him, except for the Father. And as such, I better have my lamp lit, and I better be ready, and I better be telling as many people about Jesus as I possibly can. And when he comes back, what I want him to see, what I want him to find is that I've been pouring myself out for him, that I've been setting an example for others in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity, that I haven't been towing the line, that I've been going after his kingdom that I've been seeking with everything that I have to please him. And look, he loves you. So it's not a matter of like, you need to earn his love. What I'm talking about is you recognize that he loves you so much. And the only way you can love him in return is just like, I have to give you everything. You gave me everything. How can I not give you everything back? Because you're, you're motivated, like Paul says, we're compelled by love to do these things. Or are you focused on politics and thinking that a policy change is gonna change a heart? It's not going to. The only thing that changes hearts is the Holy Spirit. By a show of hands, who would say that they consider themselves some, someone who likes hot food? Like you are a hot, raise them high. I've got to see like a hot food aficionado. How many of you would you say you like the kind of hot food where it's like a punishment? Like you like to feel pain you enjoy, anybody that's like that at all? Okay, nobody. Has anybody ever he here ever done this? Has anybody here ever done the one chip challenge? Do we have anybody that's done it? I can't quite see. No, nobody. Okay, it's, if you've never seen it in the store, it's $4.99 and you just get one chip. And then the idea is that you just throw the one tortilla chip in your mouth and then you're supposed to go for five minutes uh, without taking in any milk. That's the idea. So if you can make it five minutes, you win. What do you get? Nothing at all other than pain and a stomach ache and uh, maybe vomiting. Uh, so I, I used to be somebody that would have said I like hot food, I love hot food. Uh, I did with a friend years ago, the Blazing Wings Challenge at Buffalo Wild Wings. Now I'd had these wings before, so I wasn't too worried about it, but when we took the challenge, they brought them out and they had at least three times as much sauce on them as they normally did and uh, it, was, it was painful. I've made some mistakes with hot food over the years where I got a little, little ahead of myself. I feel like, though, and maybe some of you can relate to this, as I've gotten older, I'm almost 44, but as I've gotten older, my tolerance for hot food is steadily in the decline. I don't know if that's happened to any of you, but I felt like 20 years ago, I could, like, handle it, you know? I was like, let's, let's get after this, and now I'm like, oh, Tabasco. No, not that bad, but I'm saying, like, I do feel like I can't handle it as much. Um, so... For, as someone who's lived in Des Moines uh, almost my entire life, uh, there was a very famous place that's no longer around that was known for hot food and a hot food challenge. Anybody familiar with Big Daddy's Barbecue? Okay, Big Daddy's Barbecue. This was over right next to East High School on East 14th Street, and Big Daddy was the guy's name, and he was from the Bahamas, and he claimed that the Bahamas had the hottest peppers, the hottest spices in, in the world, and he had a challenge that existed for a very long time until Big Daddy's finally shut down about 10 or so years ago. And the challenge was, if you paid $50, you could go in and you could uh, eat a barbecued pulled pork, and he had the best barbecue, just straight away barbecue, but this was a whole separate thing. You could take a, this challenge as a barbecued pulled pork sandwich, and it was just coated in his hottest sauce. And if you could eat the entire sandwich, uh, in 10 minutes, you would win $5,000, and then he would also donate $5,000 to a charity of your choice. Now, in all the years that he ran this challenge, nobody succeeded, not one single person. Now, I personally know uh, two people that took the challenge. Both of them, you got to sign a waiver, both of them ended up uh, just a few blocks away at Mercy Hospital. No joke, they both did. One of them, because this was when I was probably like 19 or 20, uh, one of them because he could not stop vomiting. He just couldn't. He was doing popsicles and milk there, and he just couldn't stop. And so he was in the hospital for three days. Three days, got severely dehydrated. The other one uh, was actually uh, my wife's brother, who is a very huge hot food aficionado. He loves hot food. His tolerance for it is way higher than mine. 
So he went, and I was like, you know, maybe he'd be able to do this. But when he took it, it wasn't vomiting, and he, it wasn't necessarily even the heat. His throat started closing up. Like, the effect the spice and the heat had on his throat was that it just started seizing and closing up, and he couldn't swallow. And so he had to go to the hospital, and I don't know if they gave him one of those shots, you know, for allergies or what it was, but so two for two. <laughs> and I know that many other people have ended up there as well. So that's not something I ever had the desire to do. Now, if you know anything else about Big Daddy's, you know that he had great names for his sauces, right? So he had one that was called ER. Just that's what it was called, ER. He had one that was called, and this was a milder one, that he actually had called Code Blue. <laughs> and then he had all sorts of hospital and medical terminology for his sauces. So about, oh gosh, tw a little over 20 years ago, I had some friends uh, that were attending a college at Iowa State. And uh, so they were up at Iowa State. And, uh, and this makes a lot of sense what happens here because they were at Iowa State. So they were at, at Iowa State, and so, sorry, that wasn't in my notes or anything, but it just, it's like, a, I can't stop it. So, um, sorry. So, um, so they were at Iowa State. They were all sharing an apartment, and uh, there were four of them, and they had purchased uh, a bottle of Big Daddy's Code Blue. Now, if you got the ER, and he had different iterations of ER, ER1, ER2, ER3, but those sauces actually came in a tiny jar, if you've ever seen these. I actually had a jar that my brother-in-law bought for me that I never used. Um, but this was almost like a paste. It wasn't really a sauce. It was a paste. Very thick, almost like something you'd see if you went to a Vietnamese restaurant and they have those chili pastes that you can add to your pho or whatever. So it was very thick like that. And the idea with that was that you took a toothpick, dipped it in the sauce, took the toothpick out, wiped the toothpick off, and then threw the toothpick in like a pot of chili. And it would season it to make it hot. And that's a real thing. I had friends that did that. So that's not one you wanted to trifle with. The Code Blue was actually more like a barbecue sauce in terms of its texture. And it was one that if you liked really hot food, like the part where I said you like to be punished, that wasn't going to send you to the hospital. But it could ruin your night. But it was something that was like doable, you know, for a lot of people. So my friends had had a bottle of this Code Blue. And they had it in their refrigerator because, you know, that's what you want to do. And this, so the story goes that uh, their college guys, you know, their fridge is a hot mess. You know, there's just all stuff everywhere and whatever. So apparently somebody had either eaten some of this or had taken the bottle out and taken the cap off to have somebody smell it because you could just smell like singe your nose hairs type of heat. And then whoever it was that had done that, really when they put the bottle back in, they didn't close the cap all the way. And so... As stuff was getting shuffled around in the fridge, you know, things were getting put in there or whatever, uh, the bottle gets knocked over. It gets knocked over in the back of the fridge, and it spills everywhere. And they realize it once it's spilled everywhere because you open the fridge, and it's like, whoa, the smell. And so, of course, they clean the stuff that's out in the fridge in front of it, and you've got all this, you know, code blue hot sauce spilled all over, barbecue sauce, hot sauce, whatever you want to call it. So one of my friends takes... Uh, some paper towels, and now you guys were college students, poor college students. My guess is they didn't buy like the really good brawny, you know, like paper towels. It's like those ridiculously thin ones that like tear when you even try to like pull them apart. He took those and he just went in there, you know, and like did one of these and threw, threw them away and did one of these and threw them away and got it as clean as he could. Just put everything back. It's fine. Well, he didn't even think about it because he had paper towels, but he forgot to wash his hands. And so he was hanging out and, you know, whatever. How do I say this on a Sunday morning? So let's see. He, he, the day went on a little bit, and he sat down to watch some TV, and he did one of those things that young guys might do when they're watching TV, just the, the, the old Al Bundy, if you know what I mean, when they're sitting down and watching television. He kind of just took his hand and was, like, relaxing, I think you, hopefully you, you, you talk to me after if you don't understand what I'm saying. So he took a, he just was relaxing, and it was a problem. It became a big problem in a hurry. And uh, the story goes that one of my other friends, his, room, his roommate, was in the shower at the time, and he did not care. <laughs> he was like, went in the shower, threw back the shower curtain, basically told his, my friend, his, his roommate, to get out, jumped in <laughs> with cold water, and, uh, yeah, relieved some of the searing, burning 
pain. So, we are in a series. <laughs> called The Good Fight. For those of you that never heard me preach before, it'll come back around, okay? Just don't worry. Or it won't, and it'll just be fun. Uh, either way. Either way, you're engaged now. So, a series called The Good Fight. This is a series we've been in all summer long, and we'll continue in through the end of the summer. And this is uh, based around Paul's letter, the first known letter that we have to uh, his young apprentice, Timothy, who he was mentoring in being a pastor, basically. And so a lot of this list, if you've been with us throughout the summer, or a lot of this letter, I'm sorry, um, is instructions on how to lead a church. Uh, you know, basically things that Timothy needs to do, things he doesn't need to do, how to sort of set things up and structure things accordingly. So today, we are moving on into 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 12 through 16. So let's go ahead and throw those on the screen. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. If you have a Bible, I'd invite you to follow along. I'll be using the New International uh, Version this morning. So again, this is Paul writing to, to Timothy and continuing on this letter. And he says, this is a very famous passage. If you grew up in church. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, there is a lot, a lot there. Uh, and for the sake of time this morning, we're really just going to hone in, focus in on a portion of this passage. So, we're going to focus this morning on 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, and then the first half of verse 15. So, I have that sort of set up on the screen. So, let me read that. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them. All right? That's what we're going to be hammering on today. Now, before we get into the sort of meat of this, I want to make one quick note because it's something that Growing up, I heard uh, about Timothy that actually is very wrong. Uh, and so just as a point of fact, when Paul says here, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, I was always told and taught growing up, and this was on the back of like youth group t-shirts and all that stuff, which is good and, and it can be and all that. The only problem is Timothy was probably about 45 to 50 years old when, when Paul's writing this because the way they viewed youth and their culture and being young is vastly different than we do. Right, And so it wasn't like Timothy was some 21-year-old guy fresh in the ministry trying to figure things out. No, we know from the date that he died, the date that this letter of 1 Timothy was written, that he was no less than 45. No less than 45. In fact, he could have been, depending on dates, 51, 52, even 53 if it was, if it was a little bit later. So he's still, by their standards, considered a pretty young man. And so Paul is saying, hey, I know you're young by cultural standards, but don't let anybody look down on you or take you for granted or think you're lesser than um, because of your age. But there are some things in order for that to happen that you need to do. You can't just expect them to be like, hey, you know, yeah, we're cool with your, you being young. No, you need to say, hey, I know I'm young, but, and then you set an example for them. So Paul lists five areas for Timothy to be an example in. I don't know if you caught these or not, but he lists five areas that he wants Timothy to be an example in. He specifically lays these out. So let's look at these five. They're on the screen. Number one is speech. Number two, conduct. Number three, and these would be a good thing if you're a picture taker or a note taker to take a picture or make notes of. Speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Those are some strong things. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend a really short period of time going through each one of these, and I'm, I'm serious, I don't want to spend a lot of time on these, and then we're going to really 
bring it home with Paul's final directive in that portion of scripture I read, 1 Timothy 4, 12 and 15a, because it's super important, right? So speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Let's look at these really briefly. The first one is speech. Paul says, set an example in your speech. The Greek word that he uses is logos. It's the same word that John uses in John, it's gospel, the first chapter, when he says, in the beginning was the word. So in the beginning was the logos. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So Paul's saying, set an example with your logos, with your word, with your speech. Now what he's talking about here is not just uh, what, t- he doesn't, what he doesn't want Timothy to say. So, yes, he's saying, Timothy, make sure that your speech is wholesome and that it's pure and that it is edifying and that it's all these things. And I don't want you to, sorry, I messed that up. I don't, he's like, I don't want you to say certain things. Your speech shouldn't be complaining. You shouldn't be argumentative. You shouldn't be critical. You shouldn't be quick to anger. You shouldn't be all these things. So he's saying, I don't want you to say these things. But he's also saying at the same time, if you understand the word, he's also encouraging him to speak good things. So it's not just a lack of, right? It's the presence of something. So yes, refrain, restrict yourself from saying negative things, from being a certain kind of person in your speech. Control your tongue, be above rapport, have integrity, all these things. I want you to do those things. But also, on top of that, you need to be an encourager. You need to be an edifier. You need to be somebody who lifts people up. You need to be looking for the good in others and then speaking that into their life. It's not sufficient for you just to refrain from crass speech or from other forms of speech that would be considered like less than godly, you also need to have the positive element in your life where you're proactively pursuing opportunities to encourage people, to lift people up, to prophesy over people, to speak into people's lives, all those types of things. So set an example, not just by what you don't say, but by what you do say, what comes out of your mouth. A lot of times when I was raised... Uh, You know, it was don't say this, don't say that, don't say this swear word, don't say that. And that was good, but it was never like, oh, and here's what you should be saying instead. Here's how your speech should sound. So it's great to not have the presence of something uh, negative, but you also want to, to have the presence of things that are positive. So speech, number two is conduct, right? The Greek word here basically just means your manner of life, the way you live your life, your behavior. And this means When you're forward-facing, like when you're in front of people and people are watching you, and when you're not, right? This has to do with how you live always, character, integrity, all those types of things. Your conduct all the time should be above board. Not only was Timothy an example in what he says, so Paul wants his speech to be a certain way, but he's saying your talk needs to match your walk, or your walk needs to match your talk right? Practice what you preach. So you need to have the presence of these things coming out of your mouth, but your life needs to reflect that. Your life needs to model the fact that you actually believe what you're saying. And so if you're going to encourage others to live a certain way, you better be out front leading the charge. You better be the one above anybody else in the church who is setting the example, right? So not just how, what you say, but also what you do, because people are watching you. So speech, And this is applicable, if you haven't figured this out, to all of us, right? Not just to church leaders, not just to pastors. This is applicable to all of us as Christians, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. So number one, speech. Number two, conduct. Matthew 5, 16 says it so well. This is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So Jesus has no problem, right? with us letting our light shine before others. Now, obviously, he speaks harshly to the Pharisees who were letting, it wasn't their light that was shining. They were just doing it to show off, to impress others. It was a lot of self-righteousness. He's saying your motivation, the place that this is all coming from, the, the posture of your heart is all messed up. You're doing these things only for human recognition, for human approval, That's not how you should do it. But we take that sometimes to an extreme, and we're like, oh, we're not supposed to do anything because I don't want to be like a Pharisee. But that's not what he's saying. In other places, many other places, not just in Jesus' speech, but in throughout the New Testament, we're told essentially some version of this. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Live 
godly lives where your light shines. Emily used a quote last week in her sermon from Dietrich Bonhoeffer where he said, we should live such amazing lives, right, that it makes people question their disbelief in God. It's okay to let your light shine to be an example in speech and in conduct. The way we live, the things we do are a light to the world around us. So those are the first two. Number three is love. So speech, conduct. Number three is love. And this is the word agape. If you remember at the beginning of this series, to kick it off, I preached on agape love. I'd encourage you to go back and check out that message. If you haven't, this is a deep level of brotherly love, affection, goodwill, all these things. Here's a truth as we go through these. Here's a truth. People aren't impressed by hearing about God's love as much as they are by seeing it. Right? People aren't as impressed by hearing about God's love as much as by seeing it. This is what James talks about. He says, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word, right? And there's multiple reasons for that, but one of them is that the classic cliche, but it's so true, is that actions speak louder than words. John 13, 34 through 35, Jesus says this, a new command I give you, love one another, As I have loved you, so you must love one another. He's changing this. He's changing what was one of the greatest commands, which was love others as you love yourself. But he's saying that's really not sufficient when it comes down to it because a lot of us, we don't love ourselves, right? We have strong levels of disdain and dislike and frustration and all these things with ourselves. And so we're great at loving others as well as we love ourselves because we have frustration and disdain and disappointment with them too. And he's saying, that's not how it's supposed to be anymore. Here's the standard now. As I've loved you, my perfect love for you that casts out fear, right? The way that I've loved you, this is how you're to love one another. And then he makes a super strong statement. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. All right, so speech, conduct, love. I told you we were gonna fly through these. Number four is faith. Faith is the conviction of the truth of anything, right? It's belief and the fidelity to that belief, faithfulness. Paul is talking about Timothy's ability to trust God. So he's saying in speech, in conduct, in love, be an example, right? Set an example for the people, but also you need to set an example through your faith, through your devotion to your belief, through your willingness to trust God. Because it's not necessarily that difficult to be an example in speech and in conduct and in love when when all these things are going well, when all the sailing is very smooth, when the waters are calm, when everything is serene and there's no, you know, tumult in your life, nothing is in upheaval, nothing is in question, or maybe you're facing difficult times, like you're not facing difficult times, it's not that difficult right? We can all do well when the going is good, but it's when the going gets difficult, when things get hard, when the the depth of our character will manifest and reveal itself. And oftentimes that's when we really see and truly see how much faith we have, how much faith we have stored up, so to speak, how much we have cultivated that in our life. Paul's talking here about Timothy's ability to trust God when things are not smooth, when things are in upheaval, when things within the church are getting difficult, when maybe Timothy's, you know, not had a lot to eat and there doesn't seem to be a lot of offering coming in and there's, or he has, you know, Timothy had real issues with anxiety. I don't know if you knew that or not, but when Timothy's like in fear and anxiety, like how much is he able to lean into and trust uh, the Lord? And he's saying you need to do this because people need to see, again, they need to see what it looks like to trust God. They need to see men and women who are willing to take also adventures in the faith, who are willing to go out on a limb, who are willing to step out of the proverbial boat like Peter did and see if they might be able to walk on water. So when things are, you know, a little bit crazy, you need to be able to trust. But also when you feel like the Lord is calling you to something, when you feel like he's moving you in a certain direction and on the surface, right, 
it looks like this makes no sense, right? The circumstances aren't aligning and everything doesn't seem like, you know, it's just an easy connect the dots type thing and it's all going to work out. But I really feel drawn in this direction. I really think like the Lord's calling me to do this thing. He's saying, you, Timothy, you need to step into those things. People need to see that. They need to see that you're willing to take a chance on the Lord to step out in faith, even when it doesn't seem like it makes a ton of sense to even Christians in your own church or people around you. They need to see you're willing to do that. They need to see that you're willing to place your stake, right, in the Lord and your ability to hear his voice and be obedient. So, speech, conduct, love, faith. Number five, the last one is purity. Purity, the Greek word for this means basically sinlessness of life. So you're like, oh, that's an easy one. <laughs> I mean, another four I can work on. This one I got down. Um, sinlessness of life. So he's saying, look, all this stuff, you know, you need to do that. But also you need to live a pure life. You need to keep yourself from certain things. You need to make sure that you are, you are locked into the things of the Lord, that you are not beholden, that you are not subjecting yourself to human standards, to the things of this world, or to other people's standards who maybe are cool with compromise. And they're cool with doing one of those things where you're like telling your kid, like, don't go past this line. You know, and what does the kid always do? Like, no, like right here, right? Instead, why don't, instead of doing that, Timothy, when this, if this is the line, why don't you just stay back, man? You know, and call, call it good. Why don't you not even trifle, not even mess with that? Purity. Stay so far clear of that line that there's no danger of you stepping it over, that the tiniest little push isn't going to take you across it. Have purity in your life. Here's a truth for you. Oftentimes, we let others set the standards for us. When you are the example, you are the one setting the standard. And we need more Christians who are willing to step up in this area to set a standard when it comes to purity without being self-righteous about it, but are setting an example that testifies to the fact that we're supposed to live holy lives. And sometimes, being a holy roller, we preached that series years ago, is a good thing. If you're avoiding the things of this world, that's a good thing. We're not concerned with getting up to the line and seeing how close we can tow it without stepping over. Like, that's not really necessary, right? It says whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is noble, trustworthy, whatever is good, think on these things. So if it doesn't fall into that category, don't think on it, right? There's no reason to see if you can get that close. So he's telling Timothy, steer clear of all that stuff. You're the example. You set the standard. I don't care if everybody else is doing it, right? You're, you don't do it. Sounds like a parent, right? I don't care if all the other kids are doing that. If all the other kids jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? Like the classic thing, right? But it, there's some truth in that, right? There's truth in that. Because what everybody else is doing, the wider, wide is the road that leads to destruction, Narrow is the path that leads to life, and I think it's important that we maintain purity. So these five things are what Paul is calling Timothy to set an example in as a Christian. Not just as a pastor, not just as a leader in a church, but as a Christian, right? Speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Lock these things in. If you took a picture of that earlier, of those five things, or you're making notes of them, and you just locked in those five things, and every morning you just woke up and looked at those five things and meditated on those and thought about that and prayed for the Holy Spirit to empower you and fill you and able to be able to do those things, you could live the rest of your life and be good. That could be your devotions for the rest of your life. Because I doubt you're ever going to wake up and be like, okay, check, no more do I have to worry about love. I'm good, <laughs> right? As soon as you feel that, there's going to be somebody coming into your life that you're going to be like, never mind, uncross it. <laughs> That's just how it works. But if we just think, we get so caught up sometimes in so many things in the Christian life, and I get it, I, I like that too. But it's like, how about these five things if we just lock in, okay? So transitioning, transitioning. You still with me? Okay, I knew I flew through those. But I really wanted to get somewhere because this is the, this is the heart of this whole thing. And it's this little subtle thing that Paul says that if we don't isolate it, we're gonna, we miss it. And it has profound implications for our lives. So he tells Timothy to be an example in these things. And then he says something super important. He says this, be diligent in these matters and give yourself wholly 
to them. That's not H-O-L-Y, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Give yourself wholly, give yourself fully, give yourself completely to these things. So that is 15A, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 15A, says be diligent in these matters, give yourself wholly to them. The literal Greek reads this, and I think I have a slide for this, I can't remember, but I think I do. It says, meditate on these things and be absorbed in them. That's the literal Greek. Meditate on these things and be absorbed in them. I personally like that better than the NIV translation because I think it strikes at the heart of what Paul was getting at more than the NIV does. Meditate on these things and be absorbed in them. The word meditate here in the Greek, I know we're doing a lot of little Greek stuff today, but it's important, and it'll get more important here in a second, means to care for, to attend to carefully, to practice. In the Greek, this is an antonym, right, of an, it's an opposite word, that in, tra- in the Greek is translated neglect. So this is literally the antonym for the word that's translated neglect. So whatever it looks like to neglect something, this meditate on is the complete opposite. So imagine when something is neglected, if your yard is neglected and you've got weed trees this high and the grass has gone to seed and there's a snake's nests everywhere and all that kind of stuff, it's just been neglected. Maybe you have neighbors that have yards like that. I don't know, but it's like crazy. So whatever the opposite of that is, right, that's what Paul's saying that we're supposed to do when it comes to these five things. Meditate tend to carefully. So you're making sure the yard is cut evenly. You're making sure there are no weeds. You're spraying for other weeds. You're weed whacking. You're making sure you're blowing grass off there. You're trimming everything. You're making it look nice. The landscaping is good, right? You're locked into it. Instead of being apathetic about these five things, we are to care for them, to practice them. We are to tend to them carefully. We are to give them our attention. We are to make sure that it doesn't get overgrown and the weeds don't spring up and it doesn't get out of control. So he's saying meditate on these things. It's not any kind of meditate where you're sitting there in the lotus position for forever just thinking about them. No, there's an active engagement in this in the ways that you're tending to and cultivating these things. But the next thing he says is what I want to focus on for our last 10 minutes or so together. So meditate on these things. Then he says be absorbed. I love it. I love it. Be absorbed in them. Be absorbed, that in the Greek means literally to exist in, to be, to be, like you're a part of it, to exist in, to be present, right? You are absorbed in it. So now I'm going to slow down a little bit because I really want you to get it. This is the big question for this morning. The big question is, what are you absorbed in? What are you absorbed in? Think about it for a second. What are you absorbed in? In your life, what are you being consumed by? What is soaking you up, so to speak? Here's the truth. And we know it, but we often forget it. Your life is being poured out every single day. Your life is being poured out. Your life is being spent on something. That's why we say, I just spent some time doing X. Because you only have so much. And when you give it some time, you spent that time. That's a capital investment in something. Your life is being poured out every single day. I used uh, this with the youth group uh, towards the end of the year, and I had a bottle of water. I was almost going to do it this morning, but, and I just was pouring it out as I was talking. Like, this is your life, and you have this much. And every day, no matter what you do, you're pouring it out. If you spend eight hours on your phone, <laughs> you just poured some out. If you spend time, to, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have fun, but it's being poured out. And we're all incredible worshipers, whether you like it or not, whether you think you are or not, we're all incredible worshipers. We're all worshiping something, I promise. It wouldn't take me long to figure out what you worship if I spent a little bit of time with you and vice versa. But the more important question as you think about what am I being absorbed in is if Jesus spent a week with you, 
right? If Jesus spent a week with you 24-7 for seven days, what would he see? So maybe a better question than you trying to figure out what are you absorbed in would be for you to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, show me what I'm absorbed in. Because oftentimes what we're absorbed in, we don't have an ability to see. Because we're so in it, we have blind spots. And we think we're fine, but we don't realize actually how far down the proverbial rabbit hole we've gone. Right? In some of these things. If Jesus spent a week with you 24-7 for seven days, what would he, what would he see? If Jesus... This is some good old-fashioned Southern Baptist guilt preaching right here, okay? You guys know I'm not like that, but it is strong because it's stuff that I think about for myself, so I'm always preaching to myself first, like I say. If Jesus looked at your internet searches, your credit card statement, and your weekly schedule, what would he see? What are you worshiping? What are you being absorbed by? What are you absorbed in? What are you giving yourself to? What are you meditating on? What are you tending to carefully versus what are you neglecting completely? What are you pouring yourself out for? Because here's the truth, right? The world is trying to soak you up world is trying to soak you up. The enemy has the best, biggest, thickest brawny paper towels ever. And he is going around in our culture and using every cultural medium that is possible to try to soak you up, to try to get you to pour out some of your life for a bunch of nonsense. He is trying to get you to neglect things that you should tend to and to tend to things that you should be neglecting and that you should be dead to. He's trying to get you to toe the line so he can nudge you across or so he can move the line. And the line's always moving, right, isn't it? Culture is always moving lines. If proof of this, you have to look no further than certain movies and television shows. Like what's allowed now on TV versus what was allowed when I was a kid is vastly different. And I'm not some, like, old fogey going back in my day. I'm saying it's just a reality. The line has moved. Long gone are the days of full house, my friends. Right? I'm just saying, and I'm not saying, like, you know, whatever with full house. I'm just saying that the reality is the enemy is trying to soak you up. And because of that, we cannot be passive. We cannot just be, we're laying there like a puddle, just being like, that's fine. Soak me up. Are you allowing yourself to be absorbed by the world? Where are you captive? Where are you enslaved to the patterns of this world? And are you able to even discern it? Sometimes I feel like I'm not even. I'm like, man, I wonder like how much I've just assumed is okay, but it's actually not just because of, of whatever. Are you absorbed on the positive side? to help you out. Are you absorbed? And I mean absorbed. Are you absorbed? You like this word today? Like just, it's a good word, isn't it? I love it. I love the imagery. Are you absorbed in worshiping Jesus with your life? Is that the thing that you are tending to? Is that the thing that you are taking great care for? Is that the thing that you're pouring yourself out for? Is that the thing that you are just soaked up in and you love it? Right? Every, to use a youth group reference again, every Wednesday night during youth group, we have 15 minutes at the beginning when we start after we eat dinner that we call soaking time. We call it soaking time because we play worship music and we read the Bible individually, spread out. The reason is because we're just soaking in the Lord. We're soaking in the scripture. We're soaking in the, the music, the worship. We're allowing ourselves to be absorbed for 15 minutes on a Wednesday night, by the presence of God? Are you absorbed in worshiping Jesus with your life, not just your lips, but your life? Jesus said of the Pharisees, and Isaiah prophesied in the Old Testament, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
Do you come on Sunday morning for 90 minutes and honor him with your lips or think you're honoring him with your presence? But then your life, if I were to spend 24-7 with you or Jesus, more importantly, were to spend 24-7 with you for a week, you're like, I don't see the honor. I don't see what you, that you're absorbed in the Lord. I see that you're absorbed in the things of this world. Let's bring this thing home. Big, big statement here, big paragraph. So go ahead and put that up if you would. Just, here we go, just like that super hot, hot sauce, you are meant to burn. You are all meant to burn. But the question is, what will you burn for? Right? You can be absorbed by the things of God and burn as you were intended to burn. You can let your light shine. You can burn hot for the Lord. Or... You can be absorbed by the things of this world and burn in all the wrong ways and in all the wrong places, just like my friend and his unwashed hand. You are meant to burn. You were created, right, like that hot sauce was created by Big Daddy. It was created for a specific purpose. It was created to burn. And when it is placed in the right place, place at the right time in the right ways, it does what it was intended to do. But if it's spilled in the wrong place, and then it's absorbed wrongly, and it's placed in the wrong place, it will burn in all kinds of inappropriate and unintended and destructive and hollow and pointless ways that cause pain. So the question is, how are you going to burn? Because you are going to burn one way or another. Are you going to be absorbed in the things of Jesus, or are you going to be absorbed in the things of this world? It's a huge question for all of us, is what do you burn for? What gets you out of bed in the morning? What keeps you awake in all the best ways at night because you're excited about something the Lord's doing in your life, or it's the life of somebody you've been ministering to? What do you burn for? What can you not get enough of? Is it the presence of God? Where's the newest Netflix show? Nothing against Netflix, I mean. But I'm just saying. So here's another final question, and then we'll walk through a couple bullet points and be done. Are you worshiping him by paying close attention to your speech, your conduct, your love, your faith, and your purity? So part of being absorbed in him, right? Part of burning in all the right ways is being attentive to these things that Paul calls us to be attentive to. Because if you're going to burn for him, these things need to have a rain on them. These things need to be getting locked in. And you can't do it on your own. Four questions that I don't want to spend a lot of time on to close. Just questions for reflection. The last one, some of you are going to maybe be mad at me, but that's okay. First one is, are you working as a minister of reconciliation or as a minister of conflict? We're told that we are given the ministry of reconciliation. We're given that by Jesus. The ministry of reconciliation, which Paul says is not counting the world's sins against it, but offering forgiveness and love to those who would want it, as though Jesus himself were making his appeal through us. Does your life look like You're working to reconcile people to Christ by not holding their sins against them. Are you recognizing that we don't battle flesh and blood? If it's flesh and blood, it's not your enemy. If you're mad at a person, you're mad at the wrong person. You're mad at the wrong thing. Your attention has been diverted. The enemy has snowed you. That person is captive to something. And your job is to pray for them to be set free and then to minister to them and say, no matter what you've done or where you've been, it doesn't prevent anything. I don't hold your sin against you, neither does Jesus. So are you doing that or are you creating conflict? The next one, are you pouring yourself out for personal gain or are you pouring yourself out for the needs of others? Are you pouring yourself out for personal gain or are you pouring yourself out for the needs of others? You're pouring yourself out no matter what. But how are you doing it? Brennan Manning said, any form of spirituality that does not lead from a self-centered mindset to an other-centered mindset is completely bankrupt. 
So if you think that you are serving and worshiping Jesus and following him, but you don't notice a steady change in your life from being self-centered to other-centered, something is off. Something is askew. Something has gone a little haywire. So are you pouring yourself out for personal gain, or are you pouring yourself out for the needs of others? Number three, are you obsessed with storing up treasures on earth or storing up treasures in heaven? We're told over and over and over and over again, that all the stuff we store up here, it amounts to that, right? All men are like grass and like the flowers of the field. The sun comes out and scorches it, and it's gone. It's Old Testament stuff. Are you obsessed with storing up treasures on earth, which moth and rust can destroy and thieves can break in and steal, or are you obsessed with storing up treasure in heaven by doing the work of the kingdom? The last one. I think you'll get what I'm saying here. Are you dreaming about Jesus' return, or are you dreaming about President Trump's return? It's for real. For real. For real. Maybe not President Trump, but whoever. Fill in the gap there on whoever you, you're thinking. The, the hope of this world is, no, is not found in any single politician. It's not found in any political party. It's not found in anything that has to do with the kingdoms in this world because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And if it were, I would have fought to defend it. But it's not. So are you thinking about and meditating on Jesus' return and thinking about that day, and are you thinking to yourself, he could come back anytime like a thief in the night. No one knows, not even him, except for the Father. And as such, I better have my lamp lit, and I better be ready, and I better be telling as many people about Jesus as I possibly can. And when he comes back, what I want him to see, what I want him to find is that I've been pouring myself out for him, that I've been setting an example for others in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity, that I haven't been towing the line, that I've been going after his kingdom that I've been seeking with everything that I have to please him. And look, he loves you. So it's not a matter of like, you need to earn his love. What I'm talking about is you recognize that he loves you so much. And the only way you can love him in return is just like, I have to give you everything. You gave me everything. How can I not give you everything back? Because you're, you're motivated, like Paul says, we're compelled by love to do these things. Or are you focused on politics and thinking that a policy change is going to change a heart? It's not going to. The only thing that changes hearts is the Holy Spirit. That's it. End of story. So if you want to get concerned in, in politics, I guess that's up to you on some level, but I would at least want to see a tenfold interest in the kingdom of God. How do I measure that? I don't know. But I can tell you, and I don't even have social media, but I can tell you, that there's a disproportionate ratio of people that post about how frustrated they are with all these things going on in the world as opposed to posting about the power and the glory and the beauty of God and a life lived devoted to the kingdom. There was a recent poll that came out that said, you know, uh, certain people are, there's, this, you know, 80% of people are concerned about the decrease in religious freedoms. Okay, fair enough. But then it said like 60% of people think that Christians complain too much. If they would have polled me, I would have said I agree. I agree. Instead of complaining so much, right, why don't we focus on the kingdom, pursuing the kingdom? Tim, if you guys want to come up and close, that'd be great. I know it's strong stuff, but guys, this is a big deal. I hope you feel, you know, the sense of urgency that I have about this, and it's not just because of this message. It's always. James sums up how we're supposed to live so well, okay? Okay. He gives it to us so straightforward. One of the most succinct descriptions of the Christian life in all of, this, in all of Scripture. James was Jesus' brother, by the way, that wrote this, the book of James. And, and I think this dude and I would have gotten along. He's real forward, real straightforward. So in James 1, 22, and then in 26 through 27, he says this. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. So what you're doing right now is you're listening to the word. It says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Don't just listen to the fact that you're supposed to set an example in these five ways. Do it. <laughs> Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues. Very interesting, isn't it? 
deceive themselves. So twice he said, you're deceiving yourself. And their religion is worthless. It's worthless. Then he says, religion that God our Father accepts. So that means there's some that he doesn't accept. Religion that our God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this. Here it is, my friends. Here it is. To look after orphans and widows, and you can substitute whatever marginalized, outcast, disenfranchised people group you want. That was in their day the most on the edge, in need, desperate people groups. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself by being polluted by the world. Don't just be hearers of the word. Do what it says. Keep a tight rein on your tongue. If you don't, your religion is worthless. And here's the kind of religion God wants to take care of orphans and widows in their distress. In the ori- this is how it reads in the NIV, but in the original Greek, it reads like this. And it's a massive difference, and I'm going to close with this. It says to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and in doing so, you will keep yourself from being polluted by the world. Isn't that interesting difference? It's not two things. He's not saying, look after orphans and widows and keep yourself from being polluted by the world. He's saying, here's religion that God wants. Start taking care of those in need, those in poverty, those in under-resourced communities. Don't just use some sort of cognitive, you know, don't just use some sort of like, oh, I don't know about it. I don't see it as an excuse not to do anything. Well, that plausible deniability, well, I never heard or I never saw. No, you're hearing right now. He's saying, take care of these people. And in doing so, you will keep yourself from being polluted by the world because you'll be spending so much time ministering to others and focusing on the needs of others and caring for others and loving them, and you'll be transformed. There's a symbiotic relationship there. And when that happens, you'll keep yourself from being polluted by the world because the things of the world will become just nonsense to you. You'll be like, why would I want a bigger this or a bigger that or more of this or more of that? Because look over here. What are you being absorbed by? Are you being absorbed by the world? Are you being absorbed by what Jesus and Scripture says is pure and faultless religion? What are you burning for? Are you burning in the ways you were created to burn? Or are you burning in the wrong place at the wrong time in all the wrong ways? You're going to be soaked up by something. What's it going to be? Amen.